Hello everyone, welcome to At The Table, I'm Audrey Galix. In an era when gender and sexually diverse Americans are facing a wave of restrictions from bans on gender affirming care and drag shows to restrictions on what teachers can teach, you know, don't say gay, uh, polls actually show that Americans are broadly on the side of LGBTQ plus rights and oppose discrimination. Uh, meantime, in Atlanta, which is a hub of LGBTQ history and life in the South, Atlanta has embarked on a pioneering preservation project to document and preserve LGBTQ spaces and places. And with me to speak about this initiative is Doug Young. Doug is the director of Office of Design, Department of City Planning for the City of Atlanta. Doug, welcome to At the Table. Thank you. And we're also joined by Anthony Knight. Anthony is the African American Heritage Coordinator for the Office of Design and Historic Preservation Studio for the City uh, Planning Department here in Atlanta. And Anthony, thank you for being with us at thank the you. table. Uh, so this pioneering preservation project, if you would describe what it is and what it means for uh, Atlanta, for the LGBTQ plus uh, community, et cetera. Doug? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, um, the idea of documenting uh, LGBTQ history really is an outgrowth of our Future Places project. Which, is, which was a comprehensive look about the city's historic preservation program. And one of the main tenets of that project was to figure out who's talking about history and who's deciding what's historic. So in, typically that's been a pretty well-defined and constrained set of folks. So the idea behind doing a study like this about LGBTQ plus history is to broaden the conversation about um, what is history, what is historic, and who's deciding um, you know, those two things on behalf of the city of Atlanta and really for the community. Um, so doing a historic context statement, which is what this is called, is, is a, an official way to sort of format and gather that information up, um, typically by a, a government organization like a city or a county or maybe a state, and then that provides a basis, a context, as the name implies, for further research and analysis about specific properties and places and spaces. So a couple years back, uh, Historic Atlanta Inc., which is a private nonprofit advocacy organization, approached the city of Atlanta about partnering to apply for a grant from the state of Georgia to do this research in the context statement as the result of that. So what does this mean for the LGBTQ plus community? Anthony, do you wanna speak to that? Well, for me, it means what it might also mean for black history and culture. These are uh, areas that unfortunately in our country we don't um, highlight as much as we highlight I guess what some might call generic white culture. Which means <laughs> validate and recognize exactly. and incorporate. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. so this is a way for the city of Atlanta, for our department, joining with Historic Atlanta, to document history that's not always considered when history is being uh, documented. And, and of course Atlanta, as I mentioned, the opening has, is, has quite a history as being a, a center of gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual plus uh, life here. And so what have been perhaps the challenges of that? Because you know, here it's a community that uh, perhaps was not recognized, not even perhaps take that word out you know, for so long. It had to, you know, in some sense, remain hidden. Well, I would say that it's a challenge to, to picking up on Anthony's comment about uh, African American history is another example of this. But um, one of the things about history and historic preservation is that a lot of folks associate that with the physical aspects of history in, in places and spaces, which is very important because that's what sets historic preservation apart from general history analysis and study. But if you think about um, communities and groups and themes in, of anybody's history, cities, the countries, whomever, <clears throat> if you have a, of a, of a community on a historic theme that has been, um, even during its time of when things were occurring, was not well known and often suppressed both uh, by the authorities and the powers that be, but also the community itself who was reluctant to, sh to document that history overtly because they were being persecuted for their uh, lifestyle, their uh, personality, their gender, their, their expression of all that. So you have a history that um, is not well known regardless, but then you have a, a type, a theme of history that is um, uh, uh, you know, behind the scenes even when it was occurring was behind the scenes. Intentionally by that community. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. the, and the other part of this is that you have 
often folks want to uh, associate a given history with a physical aspect to that history. A place, a space, a kind of building, a kind of architecture, a type of, um, of uh, landscape architecture, for example. But in this case, as you might not be surprised, uh, folks who belong to the LGBT community are just like everybody else. So there's no specific kind of place or space that you say, oh, that looks like a gay or lesbian you know, building because they're just like every other building in the city of Atlanta. it would be more the use of that building. Yes, mm -hmm. and the people associated with that use. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a common issue with African American history as well. Correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, some of the places even, um, you know, I'm not an Atlanta native, you know, that um, I'm sure I wasn't aware of it, you know, like, you know, you knew just anecdotally, you know, Backstreet was, you know, a club and Karis Books or, you know, outright and a little bit more out, of course, mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. at the corner of what, 10th and, P and Piedmont, mm -hmm. you know, or just, um, you know, other, like Cheshire Bridge or something, you know, with some of the gay clubs, but, but it probably wasn't, it, you know, like you said, you know, this building did not, you know, specifically was not dedicated for that purpose, so. Correct. So, so how did you gather this uh, information? How did you, you know, document it? And then I've seen, tried to read the, the, the document itself, and it's, it is a, it, it truly is a, a, a research project that, you know, should be probably studied in, in classes on, you know, LGBTQ history in Atlanta. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this report is that, uh, in partnership with Historic Atlanta, we didn't we didn't expect nor think that we would be the authoritative source in LGBT history in the city of Atlanta, uh, for for two reasons. One is, of course, it's always evolving, and, and everybody who's involved in the conversation is always learning about that. Uh, but in addition to that, there's been a fair amount of work had already been done about LGBTQ history. What makes the historic context a little more unique is that it gathers it in one place, and more importantly, is that the city of Atlanta considers this to be its effort to step into that space, to step into that conversation. So it gives the city's uh, preemptor of, of, of um, you know, officialness, to use a, uh, a you know, mm -hmm. word that, that says, yes, the city of Atlanta is saying that we are recognizing mm -hmm. this history with this document, and we are doing it with our partners and other folks involved. Mm -hmm. Um, so I suspect the, some at like Emory, Georgia State, et cetera. So the, the research team uh, did a, a lot of work with uh, traditional archive mm -hmm. activity, but I think the most important part of this is they actually talked to folks that had already started some of the work and did a fair number of oral interviews and um, uh, you know, non-traditional research work that involved ephemera from the, the organizations and the businesses. Mm -hmm. So Anthony, uh, uh, how were the African-American voices included in this process? So one of the ways in which we worked to include African-American voices was uh, back earlier this year, I helped to organize some oral history conversations among community members in Atlanta. Uh, and so that was kind of this afternoon of folks getting together, remembering the places and spaces that they frequented as young men. Most of them at this particular conversation took place between men. Um, and so that was a quite an invigorating and lively discussion, um, recalling the the places that they frequented, the history actually, which I'm not a native Atlantan, so way before I even moved here in the late 90s, um, things that they were talking about that took place in the 70s and 80s particularly. Um, but we also worked, one of the things that was important to me was that we also bring in the voices of students. And so we organized an event to help educate the students on the AUC campuses uh, about the project and to get their input. And so those are things that happened this year, but it's not the end. We, we will be doing more of that kind of work going forward. Now, now I understand that one of the uh, potential uses of this document, of this research, is to uh, apply for uh, National Historic Register uh, designation, but what are some of the other potential uses of, of this document? Yeah, there's, you know, as I, um, you know, it's important to understand that the historic context statement is the beginning of the next phase of the work and not just the end of the grant activity. So, you know, with the historic context statement provides the background, the basis for other, you know, kind of activities. One of them is continued education just about the topic of LGBTQ history in the city of Atlanta. So having community forums as well as hosting events that would bring other folks to comment on the history, sort of reflect on that potentially along the way. Um, but to your question about the National Register designation, that's one kind of uh, recognition program that's offered by the federal government. The city of Atlanta also has local designation activity, which is all run by the office that Anthony's a part of as well. 
not really can be part of the, the mayor's interest in, in increasing the equity in the city of Atlanta by diversifying the voices in the kinds of places that are officially recognized by the city of Atlanta as historic or landmark places or spaces. So by working with the mayor's office and their team, um, which involves also the education and outreach, but you know, designation work as well as uh, more old history programs, um, to try to use the idea of, idea of diversifying the conversation as a vehicle for improving equity in the city of Atlanta about whose voices are being heard in the conversation. Any surprises at all with uh, any of the stories that you heard or uh, the process of, of, of gathering you know, these, uh, these sites? I think one of the most important things for folks, sort of if the general public is reading the report, which is available on our website, is that, that LGBTQ history happened all over the city of Atlanta. And it wasn't just in the few neighborhoods folks might today associate, associate with that community. And um, that included all kinds of businesses and places and spaces. It, it occurred in people's homes. It occurred in offices and restaurants and clubs and religious uh, institutional locations, uh, government offices. But it also included places and spaces that weren't buildings as well. So you have congregating areas. Um, uh, Tenth and Piedmont is one of them, for example. Uh, a lot of the city parks have LGBTQ history associated with them, as well as uh, city buildings. Um, so it's really, as you might imagine, uh, it's, it's just, it is, it is history. It's not really separate history. It's part of everybody's uh, history in the city of Atlanta. Any surprise? So one of the things that surprised me <clears throat> is that the folks with whom I interacted, I did not hear them talk a lot about some of the tensions between various segments of the LGBTQ community. And that was kind of surprising because uh, the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community is a microcosm of the United States, uh, if you say community of the United States. And so what I hope we will be able to do going forward is to have people talk more openly and more freely about those tensions because they are there. Um, all class, class dis, um, dis, um, like distinctions okay. between classes, between races, um, even between the genders. Um, and so I hope that we are able to use this document as a way to perhaps get at some of those other conversations that may not be as palatable and as easy to have. Well, I think that brings up an interesting point because this, that, something that was new to me was um, it's easy for folks to be uh, categorized in a group, stereotyped, if you will. So you're like, well, this is all the history is the same, or it's all equal, or it's all equally represented or talked about. So even in the theme of LGBTQ history, there's sub uh, histories that are distinct and are within that history not necessarily equally represented. Like so you the African American story. Yeah, yeah exactly. So you have sort of layers of complexity that I think. Uh, really applies to lots of history, but this is just one way of sh illustrating the fact that there's always nuances and unhidden voices, even in mm -hmm. even in already unhidden topics. Absolutely. Fascinating to see where this will go. Well, I want to thank you both, Anthony Knight and Doug Young from the City Planning Department, uh, speaking about this historic uh, statement about the LGBTQ places and spaces in Atlanta, and also acknowledge that we're doing this interview as the city gets ready for uh, Pride, and it will air afterward. But uh, that's the, the context that we're in, that we, we are in an era when we can celebrate uh, as a community. I want to thank you, Doug Young and Anthony Knight with the City of Atlanta uh, Department of Planning for being with us at the table. And I also want to thank you for being with us at the table. Welcome back to At The Table, I'm Audrey Galix. We've been talking about the historic context statement in the city of Atlanta to document the, the rich history of the LGBTQ plus community. And with me now to talk about that lived experience <laughs> is Taylor Alexander. She is the executive director and co-founder of Southern Fried Queer Pride. Help us uh, understand uh, what Southern Fried Queer is, mm -hmm. your, your mission and vision. I know it has to do the arts. and Yes. And, and we have been very blessed to have recorded you at mm -hmm. a big uh, variety show mm -hmm. that Southern Fried Queer has put on every year, uh, Sweet Tea. Yes, Sweet Tea. Uh, so yeah, SFQP started in 2014. 
Uh, we began as house parties and meetings and coffee shops and things like that. Uh, basically out of the need to create space for younger um, LGBTQ people of color. Um, at the time, Atlanta was very kind of hard to find that kind of community. A lot of the community is found in like 21 and up bars or things like that. Um, we wanted to find a space where the arts and community both existed because either if you wanted to be political, you had to do XYZ, join a nonprofit or lobby at the state capitol, and then the arts are kind of just, you know, perpetually underfunded and not really inclusive of like marginalized identities in a certain kind of way. And so we began just as a festival in 2015. Uh, it was a three day festival held mostly in downtown Atlanta near the old South Broad Street Arts District. And then over the years, we've become a nonprofit. We've grown to a week long annual festival in Little Five Points, and we do anywhere from 40 to 60 events a year. So. And, and so, Ed, how is it that the arts can ha intersect then with, with the political realm and advocacy and education and helping people mm -hmm. to feel part of a community? Well, I think with art, you often look to it to be represented. And I feel like as if, you know, art is just another medium for activism, political information to exist. Because if you really look at it, like, you take, for example, the the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, you can't separate it from the music that was created that talked about those experiences. You think about Keith Haring and all of his work and how it kind of commented on the AIDS epidemic and the government's reaction to it. Um, even taking, for example, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, there's music, there are chants, there is, you know, illustrations, there's, you know, video and film, there's, you know, so many different things that are artistic that associate with those movements. And, you know, I feel as if, you know, social justice movements, political movements have the message and art is how you translate it to the people because it's a little bit more, you know, relatable for folks to grasp onto. So, yeah. I was just thinking that sometimes when, you know, the, the facts, the figures are just right in your face, it's very mm -hmm. hard to consume that. But Indeed. if something is, you know, put into a story form or some kind of other artistic expression, mm -hmm. you know, people have that aha mo moment. Or, yeah, it just clicks ah. with them. Yeah. yeah. And so now um, SFQP has uh, actually, my understanding is you're looking for a space or you're creating an actual yeah. location. Mm -hmm. um, I, what is the status of that and where yeah. is it going to be and what will it house? So it's called the Clutch Community Center. Um, it's named after an event that one of our past organizers created, Monte Carlo, who passed away in 2018. Uh, one of the core members of SFQP who just brought so much like life into it. Um, and we've been, we've always wanted a physical space because Atlanta, even though it's like an LGBTQ capital of the South and of the country, we don't have a community center. We don't have like an all ages, you know, almost 24 seven kind of meeting space. Um, so we wanted to present that and create that for the community. Um, a lot of times we as an organization have operated in like DIY venues or art spaces that have been very like welcoming, but we haven't had our own physical space. And so in 2020, <laughs> in June of that, beginning of the pandemic, we were like, well, let's go ahead and, you know, put up a fundraiser for it and start like collecting donations and kind of like talking about it. And I think because of the cultural moment of it being like the pandemic, but also the rise in Black Lives Matter protests and kind of like that conversation, it really picked up speed. And so fast forward till today, we've raised uh, over $200,000 and we have been negotiating a lease with a space for the last five months. So we should have a decision by the end of the month. So crossing all my fingers that it happens. <laughs> and can, can we say where this location is? Or It'll general? be ideally, well, it's gonna be in Oakland City, which is in the west end of Atlanta. So Southwest Atlanta. So this uh, program is going to premiere after the 2023 uh, Atlanta Pride event, yes. which is weekend of October 14th, 15th. Um, what, 
What do you feel about having these large community corporate, you know, massive events like like Pride? Is mm -hmm. that has has that also felt made you feel like there is more legitimacy? There's a, a wider sense of acceptance, or you mm -hmm. know, and what battles still are to be fought? And I know that there are are many with the legislative attempts across the yes. United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, for my opinion on kind of like the current state of Pride. I think that a lot of people look to Pride for visibility. They look to Pride for representation. Um, and of course, major corporations and organizations want to be a part of that. Um, personally, I feel as if people confuse visibility and representation with safety. Um, and for a lot of the members of our community, um, you know, black and brown folks, uh, trans and non-binary people, visibility doesn't always equal that. Um, so I think that's possibly a message, it's definitely a message that's being lost at Pride celebrations and that, you know, this is an event that happens annually, but, you know, our trans and non-binary siblings are constantly facing struggles just like day-to-day -day violence or through legislation. Black and brown people, obviously, you know, who are queer experience homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia on top of anti-blackness and racism. So I think that the message that I would love to see put back or put more into Pride is having those deeper, harder conversations about, you know, we're celebrating ourselves in our community for this week, but the rest of the year, how are we, you know, supporting those marginalized communities, not only in like resources, but also just, you know, encourage safety. So I think that's something I would personally love to see more present at Atlanta Pride and all Prides in general. And is that something that SFQP uh, could address, or what are your thoughts about using the arts to address the, mm. the issues of safety and security? Yeah, so we do everything from uh, self-defense workshops and classes. We do educational outreach to the trans and non-binary community about how to keep each other safe. Uh, we have workshops and town halls on anti-blackness and racism. Uh, there's always a method or form of like deep discussion that we involve sometimes. Uh, everything from like workshops and kind of like town hall discussions to, you know, parties and social events that are themed around, uh, you know, these specific issues. So we, we incorporate it in our programming as much as we can. One of the notes that I had from uh, one of our former interns who, who initially connected with you mm -hmm. had to do with the word joy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I think that may have been something she had spoken to you. How does, how does joy play out in, in the community and in mm -hmm. the work that you do with SFQP? I think joy automatically comes from just being around like-minded people that share common identities with you. Um, and joy is something that you have to seek out and find as a queer and trans person because so often it's hard to find, which is naturally occurring in the world. So joy is, you know, going to, I think people find joy in our events where they come to a party and they see, you know, hundreds of people just dancing and having fun. Or when they go out to our yoga meetups in Adair Park and they see like 40 to 60 people just doing yoga on a morning. Or, you know, they come to our potluck series where if you're hungry and you just want a good meal, you just show up and there's community. So. I think we've always had joy at the center of what we do and what we want to give back to the community. And, 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 and looking back through, I guess, your life, I understand from you know, the interview that you uh, so generously shared with us when you were on uh, Art Comes Alive, you talked about your background in mm -hmm. the rural Georgia. Yes. And then a uh, <laughs> little bit about coming to Atlanta. Um, as you look back, perhaps even over the scope of, of your life, you seem very young also. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, how, how have you seen and experienced the transformation of um, acceptance, validation, or mm -hmm. you know, as a, a, a member of the LGBTQ plus community? I think for me, coming from Griffin, Georgia, a mostly rural town, there was no visible LGBTQ community. Um, there was no like space to have conversations or people to like really find each other. Uh, even the language um, in Griffin, you had gay and maybe lesbian, maybe bi that was talked about, but, you know, moving to Atlanta, it's, it's a, you know, rural queer people moving to big cities, it's like a common thing because it's where you find other people like yourself. And so moving to Atlanta and finding people and 
uh, finding language, language and identities that I had not been introduced to gave me more of a permission to be myself. And so I think just, you know, coming into a space or to a city where there's a visible LGBTQ community allowed me to find my true self and be myself. So, yeah. I know my staff jokes about this. Mm -hmm. I think about a, about a half a minute, if I'm, I'm reading this correctly. Mm -hmm. I got to ask you about your just overarching hopes and dreams of the future. What, oh, wow. what would you like? What world would you like to see created for folks like yourself and future generations? I would like to see LGBTQ people continue to grow spaces where joy manifests but also where we can dream up of a bigger and better future. I think the goals that we have right now are amazing, but I want us to dream bigger. I want us to dream better. And I want to see that happen in Atlanta, in a city that is rapidly changing. I want LGBTQ Atlanta to always feel like they have a space. And so I really hope that exists in the future. I hope that SFQP and our community center is a part of that, um, but yeah, yeah. Taylor Alexander of Southern Fried Queer Pride. Thanks for being with us at the table. Thank you. And thank you for being with us at the table. See you next time.